Now, where did the decline start? Well, we came from a place where Ben Franklin called the Congress to fast and pray to the place where men cannot pray in the Capitol Rotunda. Where did the decline start? Well, it's happened in the span of my lifetime. In 1962, prayer was removed from public schools in Engel versus Vitale. In 1963, Bible reading was stopped in Abington versus Shemp. And in 1973, abortion was legalized, of course, Roe versus Wade in January of that year. And in 1980, the Ten Commandments were removed in a case called Stone versus Graham. There could be more than just these four things, but these are the four that I have elected to speak about that I believe all join together to watch the hand of God raise off America. The protecting, divine hand of God, I believe, is lifting off our nation. Yet I don't believe it's too late, and I'm certainly not ready to give up on America. Two days after that monumental and, and detrimental decision by the Supreme Court in 1962, Senator Robert Byrd, Democrat from West Virginia, not exactly anybody who's a conservative, stood up before Congress addressing the Supreme Court's decision about prayer in schools, and he said this, Inasmuch as our greatest leaders have shown no doubt about God's proper place in the American birthright, can we in our day dare do any less? My hat's off to him. My grandfather told me when I was a young boy growing up in Parkersburg, West Virginia, that Robert Burr was an honorable man. And though I don't agree with all of his politics, I certainly agree with what he said about prayer back in 1962. Here are some tragic landmarks that have taken place since 1962, my friends, to prove that the hand of God immediately began to lift off of us because of our Supreme Court's decision. By the way, it was a flippant decision, not based on any precedent, compared to the uh, Supreme Court decision of 1892 based on 87 precedents, the Supreme Court in 1962, when it decided to take prayer out of public schools, based it only on one precedent from the 1947 court case. Now, the tragic parallels are this. Theological decline is all around us. A hundred years ago, if a church claimed to be Christian, you could pretty much guarantee that if you sent your friends down there on a Sunday morning, they would hear the unabashed gospel of Jesus Christ. Today, you need your mind examined to do that. Who knows what kind of thing you're going to hear from some pulpits where pastors standing behind pulpits don't believe the Word of God. How tragic. I grew up in the United Methodist Church. How tragic that now the latest figures are 51% of the Methodist ministers in America do not believe that Jesus Christ is God. They don't believe in the deity of, of Christ. What right do they have to stand behind a pulpit trying to explain to people a gospel that they don't even believe in? This is what's going on all around us, with seminaries now being cemeteries. And this is how these denominations have gone down the tube. By the seminaries, I almost said cemeteries, seminaries preaching this kind of thing to young, impressionable people who become pastors, who eventually, in there, as age goes on, they gain control of denominations, and then the doctrine begins to fall apart. Uh, the Bible is now doubted as the truth. The Bible is now taken apart, cut apart, some parts used, some parts not. Jesus is deglorified. Jesus is now a myth or he's just a man. That's what's going on. That theological decline greatly sped up after 1962. The next thing, the occult explosion. As you well know, the occult is now accepted in our culture. I mean, it was one time when the occult was only seen as something in the back room of some occult bookstore in a major city on an alleyway in a seedy section of town. But now the occult is something that our kids are being entertained by day after day. The divorce rate tripled times 20. What does that mean? Well, in 1957, 58, 59, 60, and 61, the divorce rate declined by about 5% each year. But immediately when the Supreme Court ruled that our kids could not pray in schools, in 1963 through 1982, for 20 years, the divorce rate tripled every year. Go and see the facts and figures yourself. That's what we got when the hand of God began to lift off our nation. Teen pregnancy is going down a little bit today. We shouldn't get too excited by that. Though it rose to monumental proportions in the 70s, the 80s, and especially the 90s, it's going down some. The reason being, contraceptives are being given out right and left. The immorality rate certainly isn't going down. Just because the teen pregnancy rate seems to be going down a little bit, we shouldn't get too excited. The drug culture came along, and I'm a, a product of that. 1962, it was unheard of for people to take drugs to get high. 
about 1964-65, the Beatles, the Beach Boys showed up with the New Age movement, the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, the idea of taking drugs, the hippie generation sprung up, Haight-Ashbury in San Francisco. And by 1967, I was the only kid in Parkersburg High School, a school at that time of about 3,000 people, the only kid in that school who was taking drugs. I couldn't find drugs. I had to drive 40 miles to Athens, Ohio, to a high university to find drugs when I was a junior in high school. The drug culture immediately came. School violence has become the norm today. When I was a child, having a fight on the playground was a big deal. Now it's really not that big a deal to find guns and knives in lockers, and sometimes they're used. Gang culture has come along. Because of the breakdown of the family, our kids are looking for acceptance, and so gangs have become the answer. The drop in literacy. You know, how is it that we can graduate somebody from four years of university and they can't read or write? Dexter Manley is a great example, the ex-star of the Washington Redskins, who now, after he retired from football, uh, he's very, been very open that he couldn't read or write, that his teammates shielded him and read the menu in the restaurant to him and told him which plane to take at the airports. How is it that that could take place in our great nation? And the escalation of crime and incarcerations. You know, tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we lead the way. There are more people behind bars in America right now per capita than any nation in the history of the world. And there would be more behind bars if we had judges worth their salt that weren't letting murderers out after 18 months or rapists out after a year or drug dealers out after eight months of time spent behind bars. So that's what's going on there. And of course, yesterday's perversions are now called normal. And if you don't think that's true, let me cite one instance. 1957, the CBS television network. The censors of the CBS television network decided that Elvis Presley's act was too lewd. And they told the cameramen on the Ed Sullivan Hour, the number one TV show that year, that they could not show Elvis Presley from the hips down. They had to remain trained on his face and upper body. You know, in the church today, we think of Elvis with nostalgia. I'm telling you, many of us who sit here who claim to be born-again Christians today have a lower standard of morality than the CBS television network did in 1957, just 44 years ago. Now, ladies and gentlemen, how did this happen? How did we get to the place where we abandoned what our forefathers believed and we began to allow and to accept what we now see as normal in our culture? This is how it happened. We elected secularists who appointed atheist judges. I'll say it again. We elected secularists who appointed atheist judges. We didn't listen to what John Jay said. We didn't choose and prefer Christians for public office. And somewhere back in the 1950s or maybe before, some well-meaning but misguided preachers began to preach that politics were so evil Christians shouldn't be involved. Well, you can see what that got us. Now, what about the separation of church and state? I know that comes to mind whenever you talk about this issue because you can't watch the news five nights a week, just the regular three network, ABC, NBC, CBS evening news without hearing somebody report about the separation of church and state. It's become such a big deal. What about the separation of church and state? Well, the founders obviously never intended freedom from religion, instead freedom of religion. And here's the ultimate proof to debunk the so-called separation of church and state. What did Jefferson really say? Responding to their fears that a particular denomination was about to become an official state religion, Jefferson wrote to the Danbury, Connecticut Baptist Association the first day of January, 1802, and he stated, I contemplate with solemn reverence that act of the whole American people which declared that their legislature should, quote, make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. That's where the whole idea of the separation of church and state came from. Standing totally on one letter, Thomas Jefferson wrote, merely using the expression about separation of church and state, the Supreme Court in 1962 made its ruling without any true precedent. In fact, a lawyer named Everson was involved in a case in 1947 and deemed the idea of separation of church and state constitutional in that particular case back in 1947. The liberal justice Hugo Black picked it up and decided he wanted to push this as sort of his private little party that he wanted to push through. 
Now this is what the Supreme Court ruled in 1962, our kids couldn't pray. This is the non-denominational prayer under 30 words that was, uh, that was ruled uh, unconstitutional in 1962. Let's see it. Almighty God, we acknowledge our dependence on you. We beg your blessings upon us, upon our parents, upon our teachers, and our nation. Amen. Now, ladies and gentlemen, those are the exact things that seem to have fallen apart around us. Our parents, our families, our schools, and now our nation. It seems to me like the very thing that the Supreme Court said our kids couldn't pray, God said, all right, if that's the way you have it, I'm going to lift my hand off those things. And I believe that's exactly what we've seen take place.